Hello, everybody. Welcome to the very first episode of 15 Minutes. I'm Marsha Martin, and I'm your host for this short bi-weekly program about living and getting along in Longmont. We'll have a lot to say about our municipal government, how it works, and how it impacts our lives. Every episode of 15 Minutes features a guest who lives or works in Longmont. I choose my guests to highlight different ways to live in our city and to make a unique contribution to life in Longmont. They won't always be someone you know, but I hope you enjoy meeting each one. Today's guest is Matthew Popkin. Matthew moved to Longmont almost one year ago, coming to us from Washington, D.C. Hello, Matthew Popkin, and welcome to 15 Minutes. Thanks, Marsha. It's a pleasure to be here. Let's, why don't you start by telling everybody a little bit about who you are and what brought you to Longmont? I'd be happy to. Um, and I'm a little bit amused to be even sitting here because uh, I moved here just under a year ago. And I guess you, do a, you go to a brewery, you go to the farmer's market, and then you do a media interview with your local councilman. And that's usually what that's Yeah, that's how it do. is. Yeah. yeah, we welcome people as much as we can that way. It's um, a fantastic program, really. Pleased to be here. So, um, no, I, I grew up in Maryland, um, went to college in Maryland, and I was working in Washington, D.C. up until last year. And... My fiance and I wanted a change of pace, and I didn't have to change jobs because my company was based in Boulder. And so we just loaded up the car, moved out, and settled in Southmore Park. Southmore Park. Matthew is practically my neighbor. I want everybody <laughs> to know that. I can throw a rock and hit his house, although I have to do a really good wind-up. Yeah, tell us about your job because it's a really fascinating one. I have always had an interest in working with cities and working on kind of clean energy and the energy transition and how cities can be designed to be more sustainable. Um, and so I work for Rocky Mountain Institute, or RMI, um, on our urban transformation team. Um, but generally, I was uh, mostly intrigued when I moved here to think about, um, finally, I have a city that I can call my home again. And what does that mean when you actually live there? What kind of changes are going to happen over the next 5, 10, 20 years? And how do the decisions we make today shape that? And so even, even at work, that's the, those are the kinds of questions we are asking um, as a team, as a program that's helping cities across the country figure out this transition that has to happen to be more sustainable and to think about how we get around, how we live, and where we live. It really makes me happy to hear you say Longmont is a city that I can call home. I like to think of that as my mission, you know, that Longmont needs to be a city that is home to everyone who lives here. And we really want everyone who works here to be able to live here. Honestly, I was surprised to um, feel that way so quickly. Um, this is the biggest move of my life that I've ever made. And so it was, you know, it was a little nerve wracking leaving behind a city in an area and a region that I knew so well and, and frankly loved. I didn't leave DC or Maryland because I didn't like it there. Um, it was a great place. and. There was also a lot of great things about Longmont and about the region, the Front Range overall, right? We don't have mountains in the same way in, no. in Washington, D.C. The <laughs> Appalachians are great, but the Rockies are, are a, a different sense of scale and opportunity. That's right. Um, and it, it was just a pleasure to kind of shift over. My dog loves the outdoors. Um, my fiance and I are both major trail runners. Um, so it's just been a lot of fun to readjust our life, get to know the community, and get to kind of set up our roots here. Well, I look forward to working with you and everyone else in Longmont in terms of making and keeping Longmont the kind of city that inspires those feelings. It's very interesting to me. I met Matthew when he asked a really, really good question at a coffee with council. <laughs> I knew immediately that I was going to have to collar him after the session and, and get to know him. And that's what we did. And so far, it's been a good, good collaboration. I'd like you to tell everybody a little bit about what you've done so far to engage with the city. You know, one of the, the funny thing about that coffee with council that you mentioned, it's the only one I've been to. It was the only one that I had thought to start to attend. I was trying to think about how do I learn more about what's happening in the place that we live. We've already explored some breweries. We checked out some restaurants, um, gone on different trails. And how do I get to a, a feel for kind of what's happening at the community level? for future plans, for future developments. Um, and so what really struck me in that meeting um, was one, I was the only uh, resident from District 2 there. And so <laughs> because uh, that stood out, we happened to have a nice conversation there. So that was fortuitous. Um, 
if I may say so. But what really stood out was a lot of the challenges and questions that other people were raising, which was most of the reason why I went there. I, I didn't mm -hmm. have any agenda. I wanted to just hear, like, what are the topics of conversation, yeah. right? I learned a lot about the railroad issues. I learned a lot about housing and future development plans and transportation and parking issues. Mm -hmm. And what really struck me there was a lot of people wanted space, but also wanted the convenience of being close together, which is something you really value in a community and something I certainly do. And so when I think about it, I, what, peop, what I think we all need to appreciate a little bit more, and this is highly relevant for the, where Longmont is going, is that density is actually an asset. Even in a, a, a part of the country where land is mm -hmm. prevalent and there's a lot of space and open space, density actually reduces the need for driving everywhere. It reduces, it encourages people to walk to restaurants. It helps small businesses. Mm -hmm. And, and what struck me is some of the major plans, if you're going west to east in Longmont, the Boulder County Fairgrounds are going through a revamp, revamp right now. Mm -hmm. The whole steam project that is perpendicular to Main Street that's proposed mm -hmm. will fundamentally transform downtown Longmont in a really exciting way. And then farther east on the Sugar Mill District, I mean, that is you know, a historic site in Longmont that has a lot of transformative potential, and I've seen that in other cities across the country. If you take those three projects in aggregate, there's gonna be a whole new horizon in Longmont, and that can be really, really exciting if it's done well. And mm -hmm. that's part of the key right now, and I think why I got both excited and interested, I wanted to learn like what are the discussions happening around planning and development issues, which aren't necessarily the most exciting, but they actually have such a transformative potential, and the city of Longmont will look completely different in 10 years. I think so, and uh, changed for the better. And I, I want everybody to know if I'm, you know, I'm breaking the fourth wall here, but I did not set up that speech with Matthew. <laughs> he came to that conclusion all by himself. I think it's really important for everybody to understand that the steps we're doing now, the transition that Longmont is making from a suburb to an herb, mm -hmm are gonna solve a bunch of problems. They're not gonna create a bunch of problems, which is what everybody uh, tends to assume, you know, worst case thinking. But the best case is that urban density for Longmont is gonna mean that we have a whole lot more cool places and we have fewer cars on the road, at least most of the time, especially if fewer people commute and more, more people live here and work here. I think what's important to note on this, because density can be a, a controversial topic for mm -hmm. people, density looks different in every place, right? And so a small city like Longmont will have a very different density or, or build than what Denver has or what mm -hmm. New York City has. Those are going to be entirely different, just as, you know, uh, a small city in West Texas will look different from Houston. And so we get a chance to define what that looks like right now. And I think that's what's particularly encouraging is that Longmont has set such a publicly available process out um, and Boulder County, I know, is running the fairgrounds process. Mm -hmm. But um, all three of those projects are, are very publicly run right now, and there's an opportunity for input because we do get to shape kind of the direction that that goes. And we do need to recognize that that's an asset and a, a really nice value add to the community. Um, you know, I'll give you an anecdote. Like, I, work, I used to work, before I was at RMI, I used to work for a very small consulting firm and all of our clients were small cities and towns. Oh. And many of them were in Appalachia, rural, Rust Belt areas of the country. And they're, going, they're as asking similar questions of like, hey, we used to be defined by our steel manufacturing, or we used to be defined by coal. Mm -hmm. What do we look like going forward? And a lot of cities have sugar mill type districts, mm -hmm. and they're trying to reinvent what that looks like. Um, Longmont, I think, is, is, is farther ahead there in that they didn't have an, Longmont doesn't have an industry that's closing out and something mm -hmm. restarting in the same way. But cities are still asking those same questions, and it's going to look very different in Huntington, West Virginia, than it is in Lansing, Michigan, than it is in Longmont, Colorado. Mm -hmm. In some ways, we do have that. What Longmont thought of it before, Longmont tra has been through two transitions really fast now. We're entering the second. But the first one was a farm community, and a lot of people still hold a lot of nostalgia for that, but, you know, there is no going back. And then Longmont became a suburb, and its economic engine was real estate development because it was inexpensive compared to Boulder, mm -hmm. where all the jobs were. And whenever somebody doesn't like something about Longmont, you will hear them say, 
oh, you're just doing it for the developers. That hasn't been true for a long time because our land is essentially used up. The public voted to surround mm. the city with an open space buffer and that circle is almost complete. So in the developers, guys, but we're defining what our new economy, our new architecture, uh, our new walkability, our, our transit model is going to be. And we've got all the experience of all those other cities to get it right. Uh, what's really interesting about that, and I appreciate you sharing that, Marsha, because what's interesting and what I really want to highlight is that this is the time to get it right. Mm -hmm. There are going to be some major projects happening. And to do that right means we think about the walkability and the transit connectivity. We think about you know, what's the reliance that people have on commuting versus staying um, or using public transit um, versus driving? And what's the sustainability of this whole system, mm -hmm. right? How easy is it to get around, but also how are we building and how do we want people to interact with the community? I'm coming at it just as a fresh resident in the last year, mm -hmm. but, you know, Boulder and Longmont are almost the same size and population at this point. Mm -hmm. And I think Longmont has a lot more potential to grow and likelihood of growing faster than Boulder for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. But then how we build, how we design our communities, and especially the new construction areas, mm -hmm. is going to really reshape um, the opportunities there. And if we do it poorly or we try to not think about the interconnectivity of those systems, we're going to have to reinvest in that 10 years from now and everyone's going to be disappointed. And so it's really important to get that right. And I think... The, the direction the city is headed right now from at least the public engagement that I've joined so far seems really exciting and encouraging. Public engagement as part of the city management process was something that I had honestly never encountered in another town before, mm. and I've lived in you know, quite a, a lot of places. Um, I was working in the private sector as an engineer, so maybe I just didn't notice, uh, and they were really doing it. But this is the first place that it's ever been part of my life, and I'm delighted to see how engaged the public is. Even when the public is, you know, butting heads a little bit, they still all really are working at the process with a will. And I, I think that's really important. Otherwise, you know, you're selling somebody something and they don't know what they get until they open the package. I mean, if I'm looking through those developments that we talked about before, the fairground revamp is going to be redefining where people gather and where people sell things for vendors mm -hmm. and markets, right? Um, that was one of the early things that I really gravitated towards was the farmer's yes. market and, and at the Boulder County Farmer's Market. And it, it made the community feel a lot smaller, a lot yeah. quicker. Um, where people gather and how people sell things. Then you get to that steam project and it's where people live and where people shop. And then you get mm -hmm. to the sugar mill and it could be a whole boat, a boatload of things, but that's still up for discussion and it's just east of Main Street. I mean, there's, it's so... It's such an interesting little spot, and it's so mm -hmm. um, picturesque from any part of the community, too. So however that gets redefined, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing that. It's going to be wonderful. And, you know, everybody, it, and you think about it, this is the St. Vrain River Corridor. Mm -hmm. It goes all the way from Rogers Grove in the fairgrounds, and it sweeps all the way east to the sugar mill and out of Boulder, or out of Longmont, rather. The vision that we can put together of that is is really quite wonderful. All the way, the river corridor is already protected mm -hmm. as an ecosystem. Even in the narrowest places where the buildings come up closest, um, we have really a pretty unprecedented uh, riparian protected area, and we are not compromising on that. Some of the leading cities these days are tr really trying to do, it's how do we embrace the natural assets that we have and mm -hmm. work with that and build around it in creative and sustainable ways. Um, when, we're, when we're looking at, um, when I and my team at work are looking at, you know, how are we shaping cities for the future, we're thinking about the implications of increased heat, of mm -hmm. changes in precipitation and rain. Um, we're looking at kind of what the climate change impacts will be uh, in a whole variety of ways and how can that, a small city like Longmont even kind of think about itself as its own ecosystem and own system. Um, and then how does our energy system and transportation system support that? That's, that's the opportunity that mm -hmm. um, the projects I mentioned before and a lot of other questions before uh, council and the city right now and the county have in, in mind. And, you know, I, I just have to add that one of the great things about Longmont is that in, in terms of planning that transition for Longmont, and in a way that's what Matthew and I both do for a living, 
we have been incorporating social equity from the very beginning. The idea that some of these transitions are going to cost some money mm -hmm. and we are determined not to let people who can't invest in it themselves be left behind. So part of the city plan, uh, part of what we think about when we have to dig up a street for ordinary maintenance is do we put in extra electric infrastructure so we can co offer people community solar deals? Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to make sure that this transition doesn't leave anybody behind. And that's the best way to make it work. You're absolutely right. And what I want to add to that is that there's a bit of a mind shift, mind, mindset shift that has mm -hmm. to happen here, which is we never asked what the return on investment was for paving a road. Mm -hmm. We never asked what the return on investment was for a park. Both of those are useful things to have in a city. We don't expect a we don't expect Roosevelt Park to have a pay, to pay the city back and create right. savings long term, but somehow we are expecting that from our energy system, from a clean energy deployment. We are expecting that from a solar project or from a, a bus, a, you know, downtown mm -hmm. bus system. Some of these public services and goods will have a whole host of benefits, but ROI may not be one of those. That we have to invest in the system, but maybe not expect it to mm -hmm. necessarily pay back because the public good is far greater than what that dollar value return would be over time. And, and that's hard because we've, you know, our system is built around the fundamental economics of how some of these projects get built. But well, you know, that's true, and yet we're a city. Yeah. The public good is the ROI. It's not to say that budget doesn't matter, right? Like, responsible budgeting um, is clearly incredibly important to give that flexibility, enable mm -hmm. those opportunities, but it does mean, it, it does reset the expectations of what we want to see from projects. I, I, I love running and biking on the left-hand greenway almost every day. I don't expect that to have somehow given the city or the county, whoever, whoever's maintaining that, a particular windfall in financial <laughs> gains. There's so much value that a city has to invest in that distinguishes it from any private entity too. And you so, did provide an ROI though, Matthew, because you and your dog um, alerted us to the fact that the lighting <laughs> system had been subverted by people who wanted to sleep in the dark in the park. A little bit of vandalism, and now people can run safely in the park again. Things like mm -hmm. that, you know, the littlest piece of public engagement really do have value to the yeah. city. Well, I think it's also helped that we've gotten, we've had to get our feet wet so quickly since moving here, my fiance, my dog, my cat, and I, um, <laughs> because um, we're also planning a wedding this June, and this is the uh, postponed wedding from a couple of years ago. It's a long story. I don't need to go into that right now. But we've, we've had a chance to meet local vendors very quickly and had mm -hmm. to um, for the backyard wedding that we're going to put on. And so we have some food trucks and some uh, breweries coming to support that. And it's a way to, for us to better connect with the, the local vendors and community that are here too. So we're really looking forward to that. But it's certainly been a journey of trying to meet <laughs> others and completely transform an event that I had planned for a completely different context two years mm -hmm. ago. So we can all be... Happy to congratulate Matthew and I don't know your wife's name. Um, future wife, future uh, wife, Eleonora. Eleonora. Yes, Eleonora, my dog Pippin, um, our cat Phoebe. But they love the backyard. It's been really nice to come to the Colorado climate here. Um, mm -hmm. And that's something that we have to preserve and think about long term. Right? That's right. We, we've, we've seen this from floods to fires to high winds to droughts. Uh, and that's that if we aren't keeping that in mind as some of these planning decisions are made, then the backyard life that we came here for, that mm -hmm. other people I know love, the farming practices that people still hold on to in some ways, will we'll change fundamentally. And, and we have to be careful and thoughtful in what decisions we're making now that might impact mm -hmm. that 10 years to come. I mean, right now we are struggling with, mm -hmm. oh, fires are weather. And yeah. um, they used to just be up in the mountains and we didn't really think about them. Now they're not. Now, now we know that they can be on the plains, they can threaten our cities, and we mm -hmm. need to get our act together in terms of being more cooperative about fire, fireproofing our environment uh, out here on the flat. Fortunately, that's something that was really attractive to us when we were moving here, was we saw how Longmont was trying to re rebuild and rebound from the floods of 2013. Mm -hmm. I have no personal anecdote from there. I was on the other side of the country, but it's very clear that that was taken seriously. Uh -huh. And flood resilience is really key in the same way that fire resilience and, and heat resilience will be mm -hmm. going forward. So um, that's encouraging to see. And, and frankly, uh, 
gave us gave us a nice pause of like, okay, yeah, I think I think we can handle this here, and we think the city is ready for it. So, I I think we really have it together. You know, there's a lot of people who are seeing how interrelated everything mm -hmm. is. Um, you know, the floods and the fires are even interrelated, uh, and you know, the aftermath of fire is a flood even when there's a drought, which is really a, a frightening nexus. But we've recovered from a flood, we're recovering from a fire now, and um, we're just growing the muscles that we need to be a sustainable city in the face of all of this change. Yeah, and you know, the interconnectivity is just put on, ped put on a pedestal when you talk about kind of the future plans that the city mm -hmm. has, right? So the more you build out from a city, the more like you build on the outskirts of the city, the more mm -hmm. roads you need to build there, the more streets you need to maintain, the more accidents that'll happen, the more roads you need mm -hmm. to enforce. And just that increases cost too. So there's an efficiency and a, a life that can happen. And Longmont just needs to define exactly what that's going to mean for the small city that it is and not say, oh, we're going to become New York City. We're not. No. Never will be and don't want to be. Um, and that's not why we moved here. So it's, <laughs> it's more of a question of how do we take the small city that Longmont is and um, continue to grow in a sustainable way that allows everyone to be able to get around easily, safely, and um, comfortably. And make it a part of, of the pleasure of living here as opposed to an inconvenience to be overcome. Absolutely. So I guess it's to say challenge extended. Thank you for your service. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Matthew, thank you so much. This has been a great talk, and uh, I hope everybody is, is encouraged and excited and will engage in living in Longmont the way Matthew has in less than a year. Thanks, so, Marcia. Pleasure to be here. You're welcome. Mm -hmm.